In the year 1625, workmen digging near the ancient capital of Xi'an in central China hit an enormous stone. When they excavated it, it turned out to be a stele, and a stele is essentially a, a vast slab of stone on which is carved an inscription, stories, accounts, details, uh, sometimes with decorative features. And these can measure up to 18 feet in height. This particular one is about 10 feet in height. And they noticed, first of all, that it wasn't entirely written in Chinese. There was another language carved on it as well, of which they had absolutely no idea what it was. But when they began to read it, and when they took it to the local magistrate and he read it, he began to realize that the, the description of the religion that was carved on this great stone bore some sort of relationship to the religion that he was hearing about in Beijing from the Jesuits who had arrived in China a mere 25 years before. And so he sent a rubbing of this stone to Beijing to the Jesuits and it caused absolute mayhem, not just in China but in Europe. Because what had been dug up was a stone that had been carved in the year 781, but which was referring to events that took place exactly a thousand years before. A thousand years before this, in fact in the year 635, as the stone recorded, missionaries had come from the Church of the East. Now the Church of the East at that time was probably twice the size of the church in the West. It was based at uh, Nineveh and then at Baghdad. It stretched from the boundaries of Syria and Iraq right across to Tibet, up into the uh, Russian steppes, across to Mongolia, uh, and eventually it reached all the way to Japan. It also reached down the uh, east coast of Africa, going as far as uh, Mombasa, where Mombasa is today, and it was to be found throughout India. The Church of the East was a missionary church that had no imperial power behind it whatsoever. It wasn't like Rome. In fact, it had been massively persecuted in the Persian Empire uh, and had survived. Uh, and indeed, if you wanted an example of a church that grew out of the blood of the martyrs, then the story of the Church of the East is quite phenomenal. But in the year 635, uh, Bishop Alopen arrived in China and was formally greeted by the Emperor. And he brought with him the teachings of Christianity. He brought with him a, a range of books, um, many books of which have disappeared in their original language of Syriac, uh, or indeed Greek, and are only now to be found in the Chinese translations that we have, in, have, have rediscovered in the last hundred years in China. And this religion, which the Chinese called the religion of light, um, spread throughout China incredibly rapidly, so that within 150 years, when the stele was carved to celebrate its success, they were claiming on the stone that there was a church in every single county of China. In other words, 3,000 churches stretched across China. The stone itself is beautifully carved. It's mounted on a turtle, because the turtle is a symbol of the sacred and the divine. At the top of the stone is um, a fascinating carving of the cross. And it's the cross rising out of a lotus, combining Buddhist and Christian iconography, because the lotus symbolizes the Buddhist notion that truth and reality rises out of the muddy depths of this world, and just as the lotus flowers when it reaches the sunlight coming out of the muddy waters, so truth and spirituality flourishes when it reaches the light of God or the light of the Buddha. But also around this cross uh, are Taoist symbols, symbols from the traditional religion of China. Uh, and these symbols symbolize the influences of yin and yang. Yin and yang are the two great cosmic forces of Chinese uh, mythology. They are not moral forces, they're not good and bad, they're not uh, positive and negative, but they are, for example, yin is the moon, and the earth, and water, and winter, and feminine, and yang is the sun, and fiery, and hot, and male. And these two forces are the forces that created the universe. And the cross is therefore held in a Buddhist lotus, surrounded by Taoist imagery, but is unequivocally a Christian cross. And this is what the whole stele is about. It is about the most phenomenal and exceptional 
encounter between Christianity and two, in fact three of the world's great religions because Confucianism is also a factor in China and was re referred to on the stone. It is the most phenomenal encounter between Christianity and three great ancient religious traditions, Buddhism, Confucianism and especially Taoism. The stone itself uh, describes Christianity, describes the, the fundamental teachings of Christianity, but does so using Taoist and Buddhist language and occasionally Confucianist language. So, for example, there is no notion whatsoever on this stone, as indeed there no, was no notion in the Church of the East, of original sin. Quite the reverse. What the stone talks about is original goodness or original nature which becomes clouded and dusty and besmeared with stupidity and greed and so on and so forth but essentially it's saying human beings are essentially good secondly it says that we have been given responsibility to protect nature not to dominate it not to manipulate it but to protect it thirdly and this was quite unique for China where Buddhist monasteries for example ran on slavery that's how they managed to function it says that the Christians of China of the 7th 8th and indeed right through into the 9th and 10th centuries uh, would not have slaves they also treated men and women as equal in fact there's a very famous text that has been discovered in China uh, which is a retelling of the of the resurrection appearance when Christ appears to the women first before the male disciples and the text says in this way Christ showed that women were no longer to be treated as inferior because of the actions of Eve and that they had been forgiven for the actions of Eve and were now to be seen as equals with men this is a text uh, written in fact in the 8th century AD in China so this amazing stone uh, dug up in 1625, now on permanent display in what was the old Confucianist temple of Xi'an in Shaanxi province, goes on to then tell us uh, about the life of Christ, how he was born in Da Qian, which is the Chinese word for the Roman Empire, or basically for any empire in the West. It describes the coming of the Magi, who of course came from Persia, and for the Church of the East, the fact that people from their own background came to worship Jesus before almost anybody else other than the shepherds this was a wonderful affirmation that the Church of the East was specially blessed and the uh, the stone itself we now know where it once stood because in 1998 I had the great fortune of discovering the last remaining fragment of the second oldest church in China built in the year 650 uh, a magnificent pagoda which is now being turned into a major center for the study of Christianity in China in the Tang dynasty, the dynasty that ruled from uh, 609 to uh, 909 AD. And what is so astonishing about this stone is that it tells us all about Christianity, it tells us about the arrival of Christianity in China and its success, but it does so in some of the most beautiful lyrical Chinese of the Tang Dynasty. Now the Tang Dynasty is considered to be the highest point of Chinese literary accomplishment. The poems of the Tang Dynasty are considered to be the greatest poems ever written in Chinese. And this was written by uh, a monk called Jing Jing whose uh, Christian name was Adam but he was Chinese. And we are now recognizing that not only is this a magnificent historical document about the fact that the Church of the East reached China and became a major religious force in China uh, which we had not really appreciated before this stone was found and other documents but we're also appreciating that what the Church in China achieved was that it managed to produce poets and writers whose poetry and writing their prose is now counted amongst the greatest treasures of Chinese civilization I can think of no other object anywhere in the world that tells such a story of encounter between different beliefs and different cultures and in which Christianity in a space of 150 years makes a major contribution. The church was persecuted in the ninth century for complicated reasons to do with rivalry between the Buddhists and the Taoists and it was thought that it had died out. We have now realized 
that every single village around the Darchin Monastery, the site that we discovered in 1998, is still Christian. And when we ask them when did they become Christians, they say, oh, over a thousand years ago. So although the stone was buried and lost for probably something close on 700 years, the faith that the stone spoke about, that it depicted in such a wonderful fusion of Christian and Chinese art, didn't perish. It continued in the hearts and the lives and the thoughts of the local people.